hey friends hello hello how are we doing a very warm welcome to week number eight and in today's video excuse me i'm just going to mute something over there in today's video i'm going to be working on the same music project that's now been ongoing for three weeks this would be week four of the same project that i started in a sunday live stream three streams ago where i created the idea from scratch and then there was two parts to then arranging that music idea today is part four and the final part where I'm going to do a bit of a mix balance and mix down and run you through how I go about doing that. As always, um, if you're already here in the live stream, uh, say hello in the chat, um, introduce yourself. If you've got any questions as we go, drop them in there and I'll do my best to answer them in real time. And also, uh, obviously be nice to just check uh, levels and audio. So if I just do a little bit of play here, hopefully the microphone's already good. Let's have a bit of music for a second. So if you are here already in the live stream and you're able to let me know how that is, that would be amazing. If not, we're gonna check that again in a moment or two once we get sort of going. So starting off with a little bit of the mindset and psyche to do with mixing. Obviously, we've had this project going for some time and there's this discussion that gets floated around sometimes about mixing as you go. Um, and that's something that has its positives and negatives. Today's not gonna be about that. If someone would like me to break down what are the positives and negatives of mixing as you can go, as you go, we can look at that in the future. But what I would say is that when you're working on your project from the very beginning, the idea all the way through to where I am now, there is one process that should always be going on that's relevant to mixing, and that is volumes. And so when I pop over here to the session view and we look at all the individual tracks, uh, we can kind of see that there is this mix balance going on here of all the different faders, right? And so that is something you should be doing and can be doing all the way through the process. You're constantly re-evaluating the levels of the different tracks and mixing them, balancing them together. The other aspect that you can do right from the very start is panning. And you'll notice down the bottom here, there are some tracks, particularly these hi-hats, that are panned a little bit apart from each other. That, those two things, volume balancing, panning, also, I've used a little bit of Send A here in places, which is going to uh, Ableton's built-in reverb return that comes with every single default project. Every time we open it, there's a reverb return over here, reverb A. And that is just giving, again, a little bit of spatial atmosphere to those tracks where I've sent a percentage of those over. So those are things you can do right from the word go individually in the tracks if you want to do a little bit of mixing such as cut away low end and, and do those kind of things as you go you can but be very careful of going really deep on mixing one particular track here to it's finished what you think is the finished sound mixing wise because I've been burnt there and possibly it will happen to you that you then end, don't end up using that sound. So it ends up not being part of the final track. So do watch out for that error. And therefore I would do things like we're going to do today at the very end to let's say a proper mix down where I'm going to finesse the sound. So what else about the mindset? Well, let's pop back over to the arrangement view. And let's say that when you're mixing down a track um, one of the most key things is, is preparation and organization. Um, what you ideally want to do in a mix down of a song is get in and get out. Get the job done with the minimum amount of time and the minimum fuss. Why? Why do we want to sort of, you know, get in and out with the minimum amount of fuss? Why do we need to be organized and prepared? Because our objectivity um, is going to change the longer we are playing around with the mix down. So if we're in here finessing and finessing and weeks and days and hours of the mix, we're most likely to take it backwards and not forwards. So 
getting organized, getting everything set up, be objective. We just want to go in there, do our mix, get what we need to do done and get out of there, right? And another little tip with that is if you can, like sometimes we're forced with having to mix projects down the same day we might finish arranging it, the more distance you give yourself from the project, i.e. you return to it like you feel it's a fresh project, that could be super useful because again, you're giving yourself some new objectivity. So I use the phrase parking songs. Often when they're ready for the proper final mix down, I'll park it on my hard drive or somewhere and give myself a nice window of time where I'm not listening to that track at all anymore distancing myself from it so when I come back to it it will be really clear that I would be a bit more objective about what's going to happen. So talking about preparation and organization what have I got going on in, in the arrangement view here? So let's break that down a bit. So what I've got at the very top here so this is the kind of workflow I'd recommend doing I've got the bounce render export of last week's end of the live stream so that's where we are currently up to that's how it sounds that is the track the full track exported and there it is what we can see from that is the waveform and the arrangement but ideally it's switched off but what we're going to do at some point is use it as a comparison because what we're going to try and do is improve that track right so that's the last stage unmix let's say the last export render what we're doing today is we are going to compare to that because we're going to try and improve by mixing the song the result and so putting that at the top there gives us a nice perspective in the future and a reference that we can check against okay so we can minimize that a bit but that's why that's up there what is next down here well let's let's come to these two tracks in a second but if you look here so down the bottom here is all of the track as it was previously, all of the individual tracks down here as they were, a lot of it's in MIDI, there's a little bit of audio in there. So what do I think is a really good thing to do here when you're going to do a mix down? Well, if we sort of had the project like this down the bottom here, um, and that's where we were going to work from, how it was in the last week's live stream, we would be essentially if we just open up one of these tracks let's say um, something that might be a little bit busier like the chord track if we open it up we would be essentially looking at all of these devices on this track and then adding over here to the right anything that we might need for mixing right so we'd come over here and say oh okay i need to get myself an eq and i want an eq so i'm going to go and pop that over there now that to me is is a mess and possibly talking about preparation and organization a recipe for you know a bit of a disaster getting lost not knowing where you are you can do this if you're really experienced and you're in a bit of a rush you can add all your mixing effects over to the right here and we could go about minimizing all of these tracks here so it's a bit more cleaner like that and then adding our mix stuff here but what i think is a really really good choice is where you take your project when you're ready to do what I'm doing today. And that is that all of these tracks here, you actually render and export all the individual tracks to audio, and then you bring them into a completely fresh new project where there's nothing but maybe 10 or 20 audio tracks and you place on all of those audio tracks the kick stem, the bass stem, the clap stem, the hi-hat, etc. And that would mean that down the bottom here, it would be perfectly clean and you'd just be adding here your mix effects. Okay, so th that's a big tip. And I think when you're learning to do this, it's probably the best way to work because adding your mixing devices after a busy bunch of instruments and effects and things could end up being a real mess and a recipe for disaster. So what have I actually done here? Well, I've essentially gone through all of those tracks from the end of last week's live stream. Hey, A ALP, hi there, hi to you. Hope you're good. How's the microphone level, if you don't mind letting me know? Um, I did play music a second ago, so we can do a little test there in a moment. 
uh, again. So all of these tracks here, they were the tracks um, as at the end of last week, a lot of them in MIDI. So what I've done is I've exported all of those tracks to audio, like I'm suggesting doing. And after I've done that, I've actually left them here and gone in and switched everything off on every single track, right? They're all turned off, so they're not draining any CPU. They're all still here, uh, just switched off. So that's a good idea if you're going to leave them like I've done in this case, just to show you what I'm doing. Uh, switch them all off. They're not using any computer resources whatsoever. They're just sitting there, right? So that's a great thing. It also means that backup wise, if we do need to revisit, great. Thank you, A ALP. Let me just give you while I've got you there a second. Let's just hit a little music quickly and let me know if the levels are good there, if you don't mind. So how does that sound coming through okay and with my voice? Pretty much appreciate it if you can let me know. Thank you. I'll let it run for a second longer and then I'm gonna kill that off. All right, so hopefully that's all good as well and uh, we've got the nice balance between those two. Okay, so finishing off down the bottom here, these are all the, the project as it was at the end of last week. Everything's switched off. It's all just there in case we need to revisit it so we can turn any of those on and we can work on any of those tracks, do make a change, reprint it. And what I've done in this case, like what I'm suggesting to you is do exactly the same thing, but you know, render all these individual tracks to audio, put them in a folder, and then just open up a brand new clean Ableton Live project and then bring them in. What I've done here, you can also copy this, the same as me, is I've put an audio track between the MIDI project, the, uh, the project from the end of last week. I put this track here, it's a spacer, that's all it is. And then above, we've got exactly what I'm suggesting doing. So here are now, let's say we can open them all at the same time, is all of the stems, okay? That's all of those tracks in audio now. And so if we open up any of those tracks, we've got a clean area to work in with our mixed devices. No distractions, no synths, no other plugins and things. We're just looking directly at a clean track. So what might we do next? Well, I'll walk you through that. One feature that I absolutely think is quite useful that's part of Ableton Live 12. So thank you, ALP, 10 out of 10. That's great. Really appreciate you letting me know. Um, so all of these tracks here, sorry, I was about to say, with Ableton Live 12, one feature that's really, really nice um, is that you can actually scale the audio in here. So sometimes when you do this, you render your tracks out to stems, you'll notice that the shaker, it's very, very low here, right? And we can zoom in the, the track like this and go in and find the waveform, but it's not, you know, super clear. And sometimes you get tracks like down here, they're very, very, you know, the waveform's small. It's only doing a small thing. So watch this. With 12, we have this really handy feature that we can select all those tracks there and come here just below the master track there. And there's this little 1.00 times and you can lift that up and look at that. You know, you can bring out all that detail in the audio clips like that. And you're not changing the volume. You're just magnifying the waveform, which I love. So just to prove that, if we push play here and I undo that, there's no volume change, right? Because if that was changing the volume, it would upset things like the, the balance. But in this case, love it. It's just magnifying what's going on in those tracks. So thanks Ableton for integrating that into Ableton 12 because for, for those of us that work this way that's a super nice feature for me personally. All right so we've got all of our tracks here nice and clean they're all in audio um, we've got very clean tracks again we're getting organized object if you can do all of what we've looked at so far without even playing a bit of music right we're just getting organized we're preparing things so on this kick track Let's take a look at that one. I did add some devices here already, right? To get to get going, like uh, I want uh, some devices that I'm going to use for the mixing today. What have I got here? I've got an EQ8, 
I've got a drum bus. So I'm trying to use all Ableton things as much as possible. There's a drum bus there. There's a compressor, a normal comp standard compressor from Ableton, a glue compressor from Ableton. And then I've got this two third party devices I'm going to use today. Uh, I'll explain why and I'll put later below the video a link in the description to Vox and Go Span and Ozone Imager by Isotope. Those two tools are just visual displays. Um, but I think they are some of the best tools that we sort of have in Ableton, but they don't do, in my opinion, as good a job as those two for giving us some visual feedback. So by putting all these devices here on this first kick track, let's do something. Let's say that that's going to be, from the EQ to the imager, a little mix rack that we're going to work with today as we go through our different tracks, right? So what I'm gonna do is exactly that. I'm gonna select them all, shift and select them all, and then command G to group them. And then I can open up this little group and at the very top where it says audio effect, we can just call this mix rack, right? And so we're, again, we're getting organized here and prepped. We've now got, it helps if I can spell it properly. We've now got this little mix rack going on. And what I'm going to do simply with that is I could right click and say copy or on a Mac here, um, I think on Windows it would be an alt, the Alt key. On the Mac it's Option. If I hold that key down, I can then drag that rack across to all the other tracks that I've got here. So let me do that. I'm going to add it and just keep adding it as we go down here. And again, you can do all of this beforehand, right? Before you start. Um, this can be all done in silence and it could already be in a new project that you actually save a whole pile of audio tracks that have you know no no kick stem or any stems in them but they have the rack already there right and now as you can see we're working our way down we're up to there so we need to just keep adding it to the rest so add it there add it to the shaker so as I said, you can, oops, that's, that I'd already done, so I just missed one. Okay, cool. Uh, Peggio chords. Sorry there's a lot of talking today at the start, but of course it's a little bit my kind of way and I wanted to be thorough with um, letting you guys and girls know what's going on here. Right, so now that's, that's done. Um, if we come back up to the kick track, there was two other um, effects here that I didn't group in that rack. And the reason for that is those two effects, a bit warmer, which is a saturation device, again, Ableton only, and the hybrid reverb, I'm gonna make those into return tracks. So I'm gonna come down here to the A reverb, and you can right click the mouse, or you can again use Option Command T, and let's make a new return track there. And that's gonna host let's say the hybrid reverb. So I'm just gonna drag and drop that on there and you can see it's hybrid reverb. And then I'm going to make another one below the delay. And that's gonna host the saturation plugin a bit warmer, right? You can see their names there. Now we've got a B return and a D return with those two plugins. Now, importantly, with both those devices, and this is really important on a return track, we want to make sure if we're using those that they're hundred percent wet over here. So if you add your own custom return and it's got a dry wet, we need that at hundred percent. Same with the saturation device, right? Why is that? Well, if you think about it, whenever you're using these sends here to a return track, this knob is effectively going from zero to hundred percent. So if your device is at 70% or something here, when you're around there, you're not at 100, you're at 70, and it can get very confusing very fast. So that's a habit you should get into if you're gonna make your own return tracks, set them up like that. So I'm pretty happy We're, we are fairly organized now with what's going on. Every track has my little mini mix rack that I've made. I've got a couple of new return tracks. We're almost ready to jump in here. I've got my reference at the top up there, which is the end, the last export render. So we're gonna check in on that later. And then I've got this little rainbow MIDI track here that I created with some little clips with stuff written in them. These are the objectives for today. This is what we're gonna be doing in our mix down. 
volume balance and panning I spoke about. That can be going on already, I've spoken about. That can be going on since the very beginning, the moment you start working, you should be balancing your volumes and you can also think about panning. The next one we're gonna absolutely look at today, these basically these five MIDI clips, this, this rainbow flag here, these are the things, our objectives, the things, the focus of mixing balance of volume and panning, tonal balance, what is that? The frequency spectrum from lows to high, we want all that balanced in our mix. The dynamics, loud to quiet, we want that balanced. Spatial depth, a bit of three dimension, front to back, is something pushed back in the mix, is it right up the front, tapping you on the nose? And then finally, glue, which is a bit of a word that sometimes can be confusing, but if you think about things sort of gelling together, that's where that sort of slang word glue comes from. It's like there's this feeling when things kind of lock together, sound tight, and feel comfortable together. So those things there are what our objectives are. We're gonna go in here and try and address those things, right? So directly below that, I've got a sidechain track. Now, all that is currently is just to remind me to add a sidechain track. So if you're thinking that you might need some sidechain compression through your project, there's a bunch of ways we can do it. But in this case, I'm gonna choose one option. Now, what a lot of people do is, and I'm throwing tips your way here, is a lot of people might go into, let's say we are going to side chain the bass to the kick. So whenever the kick plays, the bass gets out the way of the kick drum. So we could go into our little mix rack that I built earlier, and we could open up the compressor, the standard compressor from Ableton here, this little diamond with a triangle, and we could switch on side chain, and we could choose from this list of options the kick drum, right? So now this compressor, when it's on, would be listening to the kick signal, and it's currently on top of the bass line. So when the kick plays, the bass will be behaving different. There's a problem with this, or personally for me. And so the first tip with making sidechain tracks, why might I have an independent sidechain track? So here's the thing, right? If we uh, sort of, I think it's a lazy sidechain sometimes, if you just sidechain your compressor to something already in the project, sometimes you need to do that because you want uh, the opposite of what I'm going to explain, but other times there's a problem with this. And the problem is that if I want the kick to be my sidechain source, at the moment, if we look up here on the arrangement, there is no kick drum here. And there is no kick drum here in these breakdowns or at the intro of the track. What does that mean? Well, it means that if you sidechain something to that kick in the track, the side chain will switch off in these areas and it will no longer be side chaining. And that could be something you don't want, particularly if you're looking down here at this arpeggio, which is obviously playing when there's no kick, but maybe we want the feeling on the arpeggio of a kick side chain. And that's not gonna happen because it's switched itself off. So the pro way to do that, or perhaps the more professional concept here is I'm gonna switch off that compressor on the baseline for the moment. Let's say no input, we're gonna fix that in a little bit. And I'm going to now make a sidechain track here. Now we can do it a couple of ways. We've got this audio stem of the kick up here, but I actually think it's easier to do it with MIDI. So I'm gonna grab the original kick here. This is the MIDI kick, kick drum down here. And I'm gonna grab that, and I'm going to give myself a copy of it up here. Drop it just below the kick drum. Why MIDI? because I can kind of go in here and see the pattern. And what, all we really need is just a little bit of the consistent sort of drum, kick drum pattern here, which is kind of this loop here. And then we can take that, put it over here, or we can even have like, you know, less of it. Take all of this out the way, and then just literally, if it's looped, pull that all the way across. It's also a handy little um, track that you can use to kind of loop up the whole project sometimes. And on the track itself, um, I don't need any automations or anything, so I'm just going to kind of delete the basic things off here. All we need is the kick instrument and the MIDI. And what we're gonna do that's really important with this 
sort of kick track that's going to become the side chain. Let's just check the MIDI. I think also, to be honest, I might actually just take out the little ghost kicks, even though technically they are, they would also be part of the side chain. And I'm just going to make it the basic for kick drum beats as the side chain. Okay, so we're going along nicely. We've got the instrument on, we've got our MIDI all the way across. So now if we use this kick track, we have a side chain in those areas where the break is, right? We're not relying on the kick that's gonna be in the actual mix. So now the next thing that's really important here to do is we don't want this, we wanna switch the track on, but we don't wanna hear it, right? We're just gonna use it as a source. So we're going to come down the bottom here in the in and out, and we're going to say go to sends only. So now the track is on, it's providing a, a, a side chain, but it's not, we're not gonna hear anything, it's not gonna contribute to the track. And so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna copy my side chain from there, the name, paste it in there, delete that track, make this one white and white like that, and there we have it. We've now got our very own sidechain track independent of everything else in the project that we can use if we want like a kick drum style sidechain to go on at, at, at some points during the project, right? So now if I want the bass to sort of get out the way of the kick, I can go in here and now switch on my compressor, turn on the sidechain, and now I can choose sidechain from that list. And that's a, a whole different ball game, right? There are other ways to do sidechains, of course, but I think this is a very efficient way to do it and a professional way again. So we are set, we are set to go there. So what is last before we, we crack on here? Last but not least, staying with the mindset and the psyche of all of this, um, let me just uh, do a small little close up down here as well. Okay, so we want these guys open and those closed. Perfect, so we're gonna be working up here. So we know our objectives, we've got our reference track, we've got side chain track set up. We've not played any music yet. So re remind yourself that I mentioned preparation organization. All of this can be done prior to actually rolling up the sleeves and saying, here we go. All right, so, as usual, I like to share often as many tips and information I can. What are some common problems with mixing? What do I encounter a lot? What have I learned along the way? Well, I think one thing to keep in your mindset and psyche that's really important is only fix what needs fixing. So that might seem super obvious, but it actually isn't. A lot of people sort of roll up the sleeves and go into this going, oh, there's gonna be lots and lots of problems looking like a detective with a old school detective with a magnifying glass trying to find problems. If there isn't a problem, there's nothing to fix. So ears, objectivity, decisions, listen. If it needs, if it doesn't work for you, change it, but don't go trying to find problems. So I've learned really a lot over the years to try to listen um, with the maximum kind of objectivity of do I enjoy what I'm hearing? Does it sound nice? All those kind of things instead of going in going, I must fix something, something's wrong here and I need to fix it, right? So there's a lot of people on other videos and YouTube saying always cut this, always do that. No, listen and make your decision based on what you hear. There are many tracks that are killer tracks, beatport number ones, all that kind of thing. They have no EQ on the kick drum cutting the low end or the bass line has never had an EQ touch it or a compressor. So you have to get your ears working, not your eyes or not listening to people just telling you you must do this. It's kind of what you hear and feel. So only fix what needs fixing, that's very valuable. Preparation, objectivity, organization, we're well on track for that. Get in, get out, that's what I said earlier. Don't over-engineer stuff. What do I mean by that? If you're not getting in and getting out and we're still mixing tomorrow in a couple of weeks time, you know, that's not gonna be good at all it's probably likely we're gonna be going backwards, not forwards. We wanna just get in there, do the job and get out. I give you an excellent example of this. I absolutely love this story. It's a true story and it's about Michael Jackson's track, Billie Jean. Um, the number of mixes they did of that song was 91. That's it, 91 mix downs, the engineer of Billie Jean by Michael Jackson. Guess which number they chose to finally release. 
So you've got 91 choices, number two. And I love that story because it just shows you your pretty much first decision and objectiveness was bang on. So on that note, let's get started here. So what do we do next? We, we've got all the information here. The next thing I'm going to do is basically go to my tracks here. And I've, I always work in a bit of a hierarchy. So I've kind of got my projects going downwards from essentially what I think is the most important in my music. And this is kind of a club type track. So I've got kind of kick at the top, bass just below it. Then I start with the drums, claps, hi-hats, shakers, percussion. Then I've got the musical stuff, arpeggio chords, meld is a synth, and melody at the bottom. So somewhere in there, if you've got vocals in your project, they, they're around here near the music stuff. And we don't really have a lot. I Sorry, I don't have a lot in this project, or I think 909 Clap is the only thing that's a little bit FX-y. Uh, if there were lots of little individual FX hits, which you probably will see in a future track, they would be even below the melody and further down or any sort of atmosphere, noisy sweeps and noises and things like that because they're not that important. They, they, they're the last sort of things I want to worry about in terms of mixing. I want to get my kick and bass good, then my drums, then my musical stuff, vocals if they're there, and then finally the little FX touches and things. So this is perfectly in order, uh, the same as coloring of the clips. I always color things up so that they're easily identifiable for me as I work my way through. So. I'm going to start with all of these tracks down here switched off, and I'm just going to start with getting the kick and the bass to sit together nicely, right? That's my first thing that I'm going to work on here. And I'm just going to stretch them down a little bit. I've used the magnification in 12. Now, we can see that there's parts of the kick that don't really make a lot of sense to be working in because they're filtered out, but we can kind of see full kick and full bass line in various areas and we can often go to just before the main break or just after and kind of be confident that's where, you know, things are kind of happening. So I'm going to come to this little area here where I've got a solid kick and a solid bass and loop that up. And I'm going to move that loop around as I continue working through the track, but for now that gives me the kick and the bass together. Right, and I'm gonna hit play, and I'm gonna start doing a bit of mixing here as we go along. So I'm gonna start by looking at the kick. And what I might do is I've got this little device in front of the rack. It's a little bit of a fancy device, let's say, that I've built for the kick. But the main thing is that um, we can kind of break it down into what it actually is, just so you could potentially make your own at home. It's essentially, if you go into Ableton's audio effects and you open utility, you'll see that from the different utilities, you can choose one that's called phase invert. And if you choose the one that's called phase invert, literally at the top here, where you see left and right, you can change the inversion of the phase. You can make the phase be a little bit more right hand focused or a little bit more left hand focused. So literally, in this rack here, I've got one that is switched on to the left and one that's switched on to the right. So not the two together because we want to sort of say, should my kick be biased a little bit to the left or to the right? The rest of what's going on in this rack, this dry chain has nothing. It's just letting the audio pass through and then these are added on top of that or in parallel. Okay, so we've got a choice of left or right phase. And at the bottom, I've got a little bit of two devices. This is a third party device from um, <clears throat> uh, Native Instruments that allows us to kind of tweak the transients a little bit. Um, good device to perhaps have in your locker. We can do it another way inside of Ableton Live. And then I've got after that an EQ3, which again is Ableton. Sorry, I jumped away from there. And it's really only set to do the low. So let's switch this device on and we can see that dry is turned on. Then we can turn on the left or the right, independent of each other or both on. And then this final one, as I said, it, if it's on, it's turning on a transient device and an EQ3. Let me get rid of the transient device and I'll show you how you can do it with um, Ableton Live. So let's say we use a drum bus. Of course, if you own that native instruments device, then go for it. Let's put a drum bus in front of here. And let's say we switch off the drive 
We don't want too many things going on here. All we want is a little bit of this transient designer, uh, this knob down the bottom here that we can kind of use it in, in its place. So let's just listen to the kick for a second. And let's try phase left is currently active. It's pretty close, but I think it sounds a little bit better to over to the right hand side. So I'm going to choose to make it be a little bit uh, phase inverted to the right, a little bit right dominant. And then if I turn on this transient band, we want to watch out that we're not adding too much volume. It's pretty neutral. And what's going on here? Well, we've got this kind of drum bus now in front of an EQ3. The EQ3 has only got the low band turned on here, the, the mid and the higher switched off. And we've got this low frequency band between zero or 50 Hertz and two and a half K, which is quite high. So in between those two points, we can kind of boost a little bit of the kick with this transient knob here, would only be boosting in between those areas, right? So if I make it extreme, so now if I back that off a little bit and let's make it a little bit of transient boost and now move this around, you can hear there's lots of points there where we could kind of just emphasize a little bit of the kick drum, right? So it's a fancy way to kind of potentially pull out a bit more of your kick drum sounds, right? Quite liking that where it is at the moment. Let's back off this knob. Right, so there's a lot of little refinement in there. It's nothing more than that. It's not essential, but it is actually quite a nice, cool little way, as you can hear, to bring out the kick, okay? I'm actually gonna leave it switched off, but I've demonstrated it there. I'm happy more with this decision to just kind of put the kick a little bit more over to the right with the phase inversion. All right, so let's close up that, and let's go to our mix rack now. And let's say, how does the kick and the bass sit together? By the way, if you're just jumping into the live stream, this is a mix down and balance live stream following on from the last three weeks where we've gone from an idea from scratch to an arrangement and we're now mixing it down and balancing it, okay? So if you're enjoying the content on this channel, please do like, comment and subscribe. If you're here in the stream with me, do say hello. If you've got any questions, drop them in the chat and I'll do my best to answer them. Okay, let's crack on here. We're only at the kick. Let's have an EQ switched on. You can always make that larger here. Let's make the bottom to a low cut and we can switch off the rest of those for a second and let's just feel out this low cut do we need a low cut is it going to make any difference i think i would go for at the very minimum just a very minimal low cut here. It's not doing a lot, it's just softening slightly this kind of rubbish, not rubbish I guess is the wrong word, but this kind of sort of little bit of flabby bass down here that it's at the very bottom of the kick that we wouldn't hear in a club like at all from 30 hertz where I kind of am here down to zero is sub bass territory where it's the lowest of lows that you feel you don't actually hear that. So just, just a little tiny clean up there. Again, this kick is not too bad. As you can see, there's not like huge amount here. This is zero dB, it's around six, but you can see if I add that, I've definitely brought that down and controlled that there. Another point is up here, the top end of the kick. Um, it isn't too toppy. And so again, we could have a high cut. 
but you know that might be something I might just add now and I'll take a listen later if there's any interference of the kick here with claps or hi-hats or things I might either roll that down lower or open it up more depending on if the kick gets lost or the kick is in the other way making those things sound worse now one other area we could let, look at here in this spectrum is like having a bell a bell curve here maybe somewhere like this I just have a listen if if it's quite if if we sort of can if the kick is a bit boxy is the word we often use it sounds a bit sort of like woody boxy we might be able to do a little cut in this kind of area and kind of tighten that up a little bit so bring the gain down and then we'll bring the cue in and sometimes if you're struggling to hear it with the cut you can always start with the boost and listen out for the note so down here we won't get much of a note it's just going to be very bass blobby so around there there's a real dunk 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 right a real similar to here similar to there but as we get up higher sort of between 500 and 250 hertz we're kind of working in here but i think around 170 where i was that sounds like a note there and if i go now and flip that and let's bring in the q and let's a b that it just can tighten things up nicely there There are some guys I've seen really cut it that low, but I'm quite happy with just a few dB. I'm just gonna listen carefully here. And AB, all of your decisions, turn things on and off. It's so important to check that you like what you're doing. So I'm fine with that for my kick drum. Is there anything else I need to do on here? So I've added an EQ to it, just cleaned up a little bit of rubbish that was at the very bottom of the kick. Um, let's have a look at the ozone imager for a second and just see it's in mono the kick so that's good I know kind of exactly where is it where it is in the spectrum of the stereo mono field it's right up the center so that's good news for me from that point of view and let's close that and if I look at the kick track up here in the actual waveform because now it's in audio you can kind of see here that apart from the ghost kicks there's a little bit of velocity changes in some of the kicks there's a few that are a little bit louder than others so we could add a little bit of compression here just to even that out slightly i'd probably do that with the glue compressor here bring down the threshold a bit and just have a bit of gentle compression between 0 and 3 db here and then look at the attack and release settings currently the attack is the slowest so all the transient of the kick is coming through if i go around to the left i'm kind of removing that transient and tight tightening up the envelope so more compressed sound here more open more compressed quite liking there and the release longer release shorter release watch out for the release it kind of controls the groove if it's too long you lose a lot of groove if it's too short you can get distortion somewhere in here where you can even see the needle kind of reacts differently right to the release it's kind of moving with the kick nicely currently whereas here it's behaving differently right but again it's all about the ears so that that's a great setting for me if I now AB this a bit, it's tighter, but I've lost a little volume. So let's add a bit of makeup back. Perfect. And here's another tip for you when you're mixing, by the way. Um, if you look at the drum bus over here, and we kind of uh switch it off i think let's just check this and we turn the the kick back on you'll notice here you get a metering right and it's better than the metering on the side of ableton's built-in devices i hope one day they make that super large so we can eventually get this in and out display a lot bigger if i copy that in front of the compressor 
and then behind it like that. So I put two drum buses there just to see the levels. You can kind of see whether you're louder or softer, right? So, so now you can see that wouldn't be the same as what was going into the compressor, right? So what I'm looking for is actually what I had, which was great. It's kind of like the same level as, as it's coming in. I think we are very well matched. So I've added compression, but I've not added volume, right? So use the drum bus like that, just switch it off, but use the metering in it. I prefer it a lot more to <laughs> the metering that Ableton gives us down here, which is a bit fiddly and clunky. So I'm done with the kick drum. That sounds great. Um, the other thing I want to point out with the kick, which I didn't mention before, let's switch the bass off before. And this is super important as well as part of what I'm doing here, working from the top down like a house or however you want to say it, hierarchy. I'm working the kick, most important thing, kick and bass and all the way down to less important things. We kind of need an anchor when we start doing this mixing and a very common track in the music, again, that I create in this world, an anchor is, a kick, is the kick drum. So what do I mean by that? It's gonna set the volume that everything else is going to work around it. So in Ableton 12, we can do this great thing here where we can now bring the mixer into this view, which I love. Um, and so now we can hit play here and we can see the kick over here on the left hand side like we'd be looking at in the session view and you can resize this area by dragging it up it'll actually go all the way up there or up and down and if I look at the kick track here um, I've got this tiny little box over here so currently the fader is at 0 dB and if I click in this little box around here it's at around about 10 and a half dB the kick currently Okay, so at the moment, um, if that's the anchor, then everything's going to sort of balance up to that and around it. I might actually make that a bit louder. So I'm just gonna go into the kick track here and I'm going to add something that I don't currently have, which is uh, just a, a standard utility onto this track. I'll stick it behind the compressor there and I'm just gonna boost this up a bit until I see around minus six on that kick there. Pretty happy with where it's landed. And that's going to be, for the moment, the sort of marker for everything else is going to mix up to that kind of level, right? So I've dropped anchor like a boat. There's my kick. It's going to be the thing that I'm going to mix everything else to level around it. So in comes the bass line now. And let's have a look at the bass. So again, I've got my little mini mix rack over here. Uh, let's switch on the image and have a look. It's also mono. Okay, good to know. I'll put the link in the description of that. What is next door to it? The Vox and Go Span. This is a great free plugin. And as you can see, it gives us a really nice spectrum analyzer of where the different frequencies of the bass are. And you can actually hover over these, and put them in the crosshairs. And if you look up in the top left corner of the display up here, you'll see that if I hover over that, I get the frequency, the note name, etc. super useful. You can also change, you know, to different colors. Um, you can also come in here and inside the preset, you've got some different options here and you can have the low frequency inspection, which we're currently in or stereo mastering. And that's quite useful. So if you're looking at the detail of the low end, there's a special, preset here that helps you kind of see what's going on down here uh, and you can also layer these over the top of each other that is one on the bass and one one on the kick and then we can kind of see them overlay so very useful tool for free um, really do love the vox and go span all right so that's why they're there for visual clues i'm happy with the image uh, i'm happy with the span let's say we leave span up here let's bring on our eq8 open it up. Also the EQ8, I have to say, has a pretty good spectrum analyzer and it's the one I kind of use all the time because we can kind of see it here as well. So you don't have to have the span. Um, the EQ8 does a good job. So let's switch off what we don't need here. Let's have a low cut and let's just see what happens if we low cut the bass a little bit. And I generally start with it more extreme than I need so I can kind of hear what, what I have to work with when it's too much, when it's not enough, perhaps. Yep, 
Yeah, and already that kind of low cut there, it is getting into a little bit the bottom of the bass that we can see happening down here, but most of the bass that we're actually hearing is this frequency up here. So if we listen carefully to the kick drum for a second, we're actually improving the relationship between the kick and the bass by having this little low cut at the moment. And I don't think it's really hurting the bass. I didn't feel like that's really hurting the sound of this bass line. And if we look up here at the kick drum and we open its EQ, so let's do that for a second. Let's have the EQ8 up here. And we look, our kick drum is a G sharp zero at 50 hertz. It's sitting right there at 50 hertz on the grid. And now we can sort of rock on over to the bass and say, okay, if I hover my mouse at 50 hertz, the kick drum is sitting kind of there, right where I put my mouse pointer, right? So this little cut here is saying the kick is owning like essentially there at the moment, right? So it's a good, it's, it's actually a good move. Um, the other way we could tackle it if the bass really needed all of that would be having potentially a side chain so that when the kick happens, the bass gets out the way of the kick. So let's maybe do that as a comparison. It possibly is going to be helpful for you guys and girls. So let's say there's this low cut choice. I want to watch out that I don't cut too much away but that's helping the kick punch through nicely, get out the way. But let's say we have, let's do two EQs here, so we'll duplicate it. And one of these, I'm going to have no low cut. I'll switch that one off for a second. And in this case, I'm not touching the EQ, but I'm going to side chain the bass to the kick. So we're gonna do that classic move. We've got the compressor switched on. I already set it up earlier. It's side chaining to that side chain track I made. And now we can come over here and bring down the threshold of the compressor and adjust it till we hear that kind of, that it's engaging on the track. And we can also open up this view and see like where the kick is. This is the, you know, the kick happening and where it's working up and down. Right, and then we can adjust, you know, things like if you if you look at this view, you can see if I make the attack super slow, then the compressor the compressor the compressor's not really doing a lot. If I put that back, you can see the attack phase of the compressor's working, and the release same thing. If I make the release longer, we can see we're really changing the side chain, right? What's going on there? So let's say we leave that pretty much default. And if I increase the ratio, whatever's going over the threshold, that's this line here, is being compressed, right? So the lower the threshold, the more of the base that's getting compressed, the higher the threshold, it's just that little bit that's going over the threshold that's going to be being compressed. Up here, nothing, no compression, right? And if we increase the ratio, whatever goes over the threshold here is more aggressively compressed. So four is a good ratio for sidechain. We could also have eight. And it's stronger. I'm happy with four. Not 40. What's that? 4.0, I guess. Let's try that. That's better. So let's A, B that. Similar to before, we could do with a little bit of volume back for the volume we've taken away. And you can also check that in this view here, you can change what you see here to the output. And then you can see uh, the white line and the gray is kind of, you know, what we've uh, removed. And you'll see down here, it's telling us that we're currently chopping away four and a half dB. So you can kind of see that it gives you quite a bit of information. So you could, right, go all the way back up there with the makeup before and after, let's say, but I kind of like to do that manually and all I'm looking for is a lot less forced volume back than, than what we have. I just want to A, B this and say side chained or not side chained, right? That's all I'm looking for personally myself. That's my own decision there. So, and it's side chaining, it's absolutely. So here we've got no EQ, but a side chain and the kick and the bass, how do they sound together? So again, maybe just for a second, remind ourselves how the kick sounds. It's that nice punchy kick there. So 
So often you need to do this because the thing we're trying to help here is actually the kick by compressing the bass, side chaining it to it. So it's sort of saying that's how the kick sounds with nothing else playing at the same time. And now we want that kick to sound like it did but now it has the bass together with it, right? So I think that side chain compression is nice. It also gives, let's listen to the bass on its own. It kind of gives it a little bit of groove, just a very subtle amount. I'm not sure if you can possibly hear that, but it just kind of makes it actually groove with the track a little bit more, right? Let's maybe have the EQ that I first used over here. Let's switch that one off that's doing nothing and actually bring this one in here. What's happened there? Interesting. Okay, there we go. Just lost the view for a moment. So let's just see if we could also have a low cut as well and does that also help the kick? Yeah, I like a little bit of a low cut there on the bass and the sidechain compressor that we've got next door. So I quite like that decision. Let's have a listen to the top of the bass line. So apologies there, I just clicked on the wrong thing. So let's open that EQ back up. And don't be afraid to have multiple EQs here doing different things. That's absolutely fine. You can add as many plugins and devices you like here um, as you need, whatever you need to get the job done. Okay, so again, where's the top end of the bass? And watch out for sounds when you're doing the high cut. It's as important often as the low cut. Get a feel for what, what lives up there. And often it's a lot of air. It's kind of like this beautiful air again takes a little bit of practice to hearing but again I might come back and revisit that maybe later there's too much high end here in the bass and it gets in the way of the clap or the hi-hats or something that wants to be up there and I come back and revisit this same as I could with the kick for now I'm happy with both those two tracks another thing I've got to play with so now let's do the the bass volume balance it's actually really pretty good where it is um, I'm looking at the meters here. I see the base is where on volume. Let's see where it ends up up the top here. The average peak is this little box here that I'm clicking it that recalibrates. I'd like to see about nine there. So I might get another utility and drop it on here. And let's put it after the compressor and I'm gonna turn it up a little bit. getting nearly about there. So we've got about 3 dB difference. The bass line is about 3 dB quieter than the kick. So that's quite a nice balance between those two. Now, earlier I set up a couple of new return tracks and I have this a bit warmer, this saturator on return D. I'm gonna actually try a little bit of sending some of the bass to D. Let's hear what that sounds like. Right, so probably a little bit goes a long way here. We could also try a little bit of the kick. Nice. So that's just giving us a little bit of fat fatner on the way through to the master track. So if I take out D now, I'm just going to switch off D return. Let's listen to the difference between the two, two tracks. It's nice. Brings out this kind of nice presence in it. It doesn't have to be super powerful. We can back that off a little bit just so it's again a bit more subtle. All right, so working our way along here. And if we just switch the mixer off for a second, we've done the kick and bass. I'm super happy with those two. So I can minimize those a bit. We've already used the sidechain track. Great. It's doing its work on the bass. Let's have the clap. And again, if the loop that we're currently looped in isn't in the right place, then we move our loop along, right? So sometimes you might want to zoom out and check, but I'm happy that the clap is absolutely in, in a good place here. So mix rack on, let's have the image for starters just to see if we've got any stereo. Yeah, so we've got a little bit of width on this one. And that's good, because it kind of gets it a little bit apart from the, the kick and the bass, like that. That's a good thing for me to see that. And naturally that sample and current track currently has that. We look at it in span. 
we see this and we can always grab these sliders here and again sort of you know zoom zoom right in to have a look at what's going on in the waveform this is particularly useful if you are dealing with spikes or resonances as they're known that don't sound pleasant so you could come right in here hover with the crosshairs and say okay that's at 5.2k and then go and resolve that in an eq so it's very useful what i see there is nothing my ears don't tell me any problems but to have an EQ we're doing tonal balance here we're doing dynamics so so far looking at my little rainbow flag earlier volume we are absolutely taken care of tonal balance is the EQ dynamics was the sidechain compressor for example and the compression on the kick that had a compressor just to kind of pull it in line I didn't compress the bass as well as the sidechain and I feel like if you look at the waveform it's fairly uniform between the peaks and the quieter. If we wanted, we could kind of turn it up a little bit in the quieters versus quiet areas versus the peak. But there's nothing nasty in this waveform across here that says, hey, you need a lot of compression. But we might visit that later, but I'm kind of happy with that. Similar to the clap, you'll notice again the waveform. There might be a little bit of velocity differences between some of the hits, but it's fairly uniform. So clap. Let's get a frequency balance with the EQ. Let's put it in its space. Again, we're going to switch off all the ones we don't need. down a little bit more the low end certainly didn't need somewhere around there and you'll possibly notice so far I've not been doing any wild boosts or any major cuts or anything like that but um, you know mostly if you look at EQ work and professionals it's generally cuts rather than boosts if you boost things it would be because you know there's something in this clap that you want to bring out so if we sort of hovered here and said okay um, let me go back to the EQ there's a point here somewhere I'd like to bring out because it's not out enough in the mix I could turn this one on here find you know the different points of the clap I, I don't need to do that but there's a real obvious kind of emphasis of the clap there the real a real note of it and a little tip for Ableton's EQ here if you're wanting to check this a bit more carefully click over here on the EQ this little headphone icon and then you're going to click and hold down this point and now we're just here that point that I've emphasized right so if I now kind of made this something that would make sense bring it right down and make it nice and smooth like that boosts are generally very very smooth they look like very organic shape smoothly not like this like a little pimple they're kind of nice and smoothed out cut can be much more narrow a boost generally better when it's wider and let's turn this on and off you can really hear it's emphasized that clap in that area I don't need that this mix doesn't need that but there's an example of you know again how you could use the EQ in a way so I'm kind of happy with this apart from perhaps the balance of the volume now so let's bring our mixer up Bring the clap all the way down. For now, somewhere like that. Maybe a little bit of the D return, so a bit of send to the saturation device. So we're getting this kind of common 
nice little bit of color that's going on in this track across the kick, the bass, and the clap at this point in time. Now, the other return that I gave myself previously is the uh, other reverb. I love the hybrid reverb. Uh, Ableton's built-in reverb is fine, and for a lot of us that have been using it for years and years and years, it does the business, but we have this beautiful hybrid reverb. Perhaps another day I can deep dive in this, what's great about it. But, you know, I've given myself two reverbs here, and I'd quite like a bit of the clap maybe to have a bit of reverb on it. So what I might do just for a second, and a couple of key things that I've been doing as I go along here, you'll notice that I'm never working on one sound on its own. I always work in context with other parts. And in a moment, we're almost reaching our limit. We've got three things playing at the same time. That's about the most we can focus on with our hearing. You notice I'm not playing the whole track at the same time now and trying to mix it. We're working our way through, balancing things together. We've got the low end balance. We're adding drums now. And I'll slowly, but surely, of course, I'll check them together later, but I'm working on three things at a time. So soon I'll be just doing the clap and hi-hats and then checking it with the kick and then check it with the bass and then just keeping about three things going at the same time for context. So don't work in solo and don't work with too many tracks at the same time. You'll just get lost and you'll have no context whatsoever. So I'm going to solo the clap for a second just to find a reverb here. And I want to send it to the hybrid, which is send B. And I'm going to make it extreme for a second, just so I can find the one I'd like to kind of have on this track. And then I'm going to use it right across the whole project. So early reflections could be nice for a little bit of reverb. Real spaces can be nice. Let's maybe try real spaces. I don't need a huge, big, re epic reverb. I just want a little bit of spatialness to this, this clap. So it sounds like it's not dry in a room where there was no real room. And, you know, we live and work in an area where, um, you know, reverb is something that's very natural to us. I'm speaking in a space now that has reverb. You're listening in a space that has, probably has reverb. And so no reverb can sound very unnerving. A ALP, multiband compressor is a big mystery for me. I think it's a big mystery for a lot of us. To be honest, um, uh, I'll make a note of that and maybe one day I can kind of go into multiband a little bit and how you can use it. Just think of it that what its advantage is is that it's a compressor that can focus just on individual frequency bands, right? So we can just compress the low end or just compress the mid or just compress the highs. And it's, it's very useful, but at this stage in a balance and mix, it's not really something we have to essentially drag in at this point in time. It's most common use is mastering. So I hope that helps. Somehow I was not really able to learn or internalize that in my workflow. Yeah, well, I think, as I said, AALP, you can have it in your mixing workflow, but I think it's more powerful in a mastering workflow, um, just in its basic sense. Hope that helps. We can deep dive on it in another day, find an application for it. So I'm just gonna have a quick check through here find a fa favorite one or two. Where's the Berlin guy? Shout out to Berlin crew. Nearly what I was looking for. Okay, so there's one there that might work. I'll just try early reflections as well. That one's pretty good. I want something quite tight. So not a long decay. Interesting, but not what we're looking for. I often use the intimate space, quite a good one. Let's do small ambience, that's a good one. So now I'm gonna bring the B send is extreme, so we're gonna hear all of that reverb, but now I'm gonna dial it right back to nothing 
and then let's put it in with the rest of the track and I'll bring the B send up a little bit. And that's about it. You know, if I want more reverb, and now we can hear the tail, right? So there's that, and then the tail, so you can even see it here, that if we play and then we hit stop, just watch for the tail of this clap now. Right, it dies away slowly there. And if that was more extreme, then there would be longer before it dies away to silence. That's the decay and the decay time over here, or the decay time here, depending on how it's set up. So I don't want any anywhere near any of those extremes. I just want that little bit of vibe on it. So again, back over here, take it out of solo, and somewhere around about, nine o'clock or somewhere there looks sounds good to me so it's got a nice little bit of reverb on it don't typically add reverb to basses and kicks sometimes a bass might have it but in this particular track I don't feel it needs any bass uh, any reverb on the bass so let's move on we're now incorporating the B send it's part of the uh, the thinking as we go along same with the D send and return both of those are now adding character and putting things into a space which is great news so we're going to use those right the way through so let's have the hi-hat and now let's say we don't use the bass line for the moment reminding ourselves about the three elements at, at one time that's great that's more than enough three drum sounds as well so they are aligned with each other they're all part of the drum kit what's going on in the ozone imager it's got a little bit of stereo to it. It's also leaning a little bit to the left in volume. How can I tell that? If I look at the meters here, I can see, and also here, it's panned a little left. So I'm gonna actually follow that. It's panning and make it even a little bit more across the left. Give it a nice bit of space. I can see over here with the shaker, you'll notice it's the opposite. So it's louder on the right channel than the left channel. Well, that's great because these can make a nice pair. Now that's a tip with panning. Follow the louder side. Don't try and counterbalance the louder side and, and, and go to the left. Actually follow it, emphasize that side, right? So we'll come back to the shaker, but there's a nice look for partnerships if you do panning like that, because that can make things sound really nice. Like my shaker's here, my hi-hat's there, and they kind of sit together. And again, it doesn't have to be all the way over there. We just kind of want to follow that a little bit for now. Okay. What else have we got? Let's have a look at the span. Is there any sort of nasty peaks that sort of pop out there that would be way louder than everything else? There's a little area here, but it's it's tiny. It's nothing significant. Unlikely to be something I would personally worry too much about. Let's get our EQ in. Let's see if there's some EQing required. Is there any junk in the low end we don't need? Let's blow up the display here. And we can see there's kind of low frequency stuff going on with this hi-hat and definitely I don't see any reason for that, and I'm going to listen now and have a little play. A being all the time, what have I done? What did it sound like before? What does it sound like now? That's so important. We're listening in context, so we're balancing it against our clap and we're balancing it against our kick drum. And up here in the high end, the high frequencies, many, many people neglect up here. They're so concentrated on kick and bass down the bottom here, they forget that up here we've got shakers and hi-hats and claps and things all clashing. Maybe the kick is there, maybe the bass is up here. And we wanna know what's gonna own that space and how they're all gonna fit together. Quite like that for the moment. So here's something I mentioned before about revisiting. So maybe what I might do now is quickly just pop to the clap and say, what happens in the clap EQ if I change the top of that? So the hi-hat, that doesn't sound as good for me. It's masking the hi-hat. So the cut was good and maybe I could go lower because the lower I go here, the more the hi-hat is sitting up here now. So I'm listening out for that. And I, so I think this can come down a bit. And that's really good, you know, somewhere in there. 
um, helping the hi-hat own its space the same as we kind of did with the bass at the bottom. And it's in there and I am really fussy I do tend to finesse these things but for the purpose of a video like this we want to work through it a little bit uh, not over obsessing right. Okay so something else I'm kind of hearing here let's pop in the bass now just to have a listen to where we're up to and I'm going to bring my hi-hat volume down remember the kick is the anchor track let's have a little bit of reverb on the hi-hat just to place it into again the same drum space as the clap let's have also some saturation That's sitting for me in front of the clap a little bit, the hi-hat, but not too much. They're kind of almost in the same space, right? And the kick and the bass are nice and down the center. So if we look at the master track for one second, I do have some effects on the master track, but the main one I'd be checking in with from time to time is a mono utility. All that is, is Ableton's audio effects, popping down to the utility, opening it up and just taking the mono out of there and just dragging and dropping it. That's going to allow me as I go through this process to check in my mono stereo compatibility between how my track currently sounds in mono when it's summed to mono, this is switched on. And then what happens when we release that in stereo and what I'm looking for in my music again I make sort of club tracks and this kind of style of music most nightclubs are generally mono PAs so I'd like it to really work well in mono I don't want anything to disappear or get lost but I also want it to be a super nice stereo listener listening experience if you're on Spotify or listening on the back of the bus or whatever right so we're trying to get the best of both worlds there stick a mono in your master and car constantly check into that because if something's too wide or phasing or something like that it might well very disappear in mono when you sum the track to mono which is what's going on here when I switch this on right so that's a really important thing the rest are just again the same visual meters we've seen on individual tracks they're here on the main track so again if I want to check like you know what everything together at the moment that's what it's currently doing or look at it here for the frequency spectrum I can see that we have actually got our low end up here and we're starting to get a bit of a smiley face which is good in the EQ shape this is the mid frequencies, mid lows here. The bass is quite dominant in the mid lows, which is okay. That's the bass, there's the kick. High hats are right up here and the clap's sort of in here. So we're in, we're in good shape at the moment, right? And we can kind of hear that, hopefully. Okay, so let's say one last thing with the high hats that could be a possibility here is that currently on the bass line, I added a sidechain compressor, right? And with the hi-hats, let's just have a little look. We'll just close a few of these things down. I mean, visually, you shouldn't pay too much attention to it there, but the hi-hat is definitely landing at times when the kick is landing, right? There's no doubt about that. I could kind of hear that. can also see that it goes up and down a lot in velocity, so I think it could do with a little bit of compression. So let's maybe do that first. Let's have a little bit of compression on the, on the hi-hat track. Just a gentle compressor, so I'm happy with the EQ. Let's turn on my favorite glue compressor. Turn down the threshold. Let's make sure I'm on the right track. And which I wasn't, so now we should see something. Just wiggling the knob slightly. So again, Another day we could possibly do a compression masterclass, but see the most difficult effect to probably hear what it's doing of all the mixing effects and audio effects and understanding what it's doing, what's roll, what role it is. In, in this case, it's currently kind of leveling out a little bit the quiet and the loud. So we're turning down some of these louder hits, these little spikes and getting them closer to the softer hits and we're sacrificing some transient to do that 
and a little bit of the, the body. So I quite like the attack where it is. Listening out for the same sort of groove and feeling and volume again. What have I lost in volume by compressing it at the moment? A little bit, so let's have the makeup back and try and have that so it's sounding the same sort of levels, but then it's now compressed with the same levels, right? Let's tighten that up a little bit for me. The other idea I thought about, which I was gonna do before, but I think I've done it in the right order, is I'm actually gonna copy this sidechain compressor that I've got on the bass line. And I'm gonna add that to this hi-hat track over here. Well, let's drag it into the rack. And I think it can be before, after the EQ, but before the compression, compressor I just add, added. And let's reset it a bit, zero out the makeup gain, um, everything else is okay. Uh, the threshold, let's reset it and let's just set up, see if this benefits from a little bit of side chain. Now we can make the hi-hats pump like that, right? That side chain over side chaining is, is you're going to get a pump, but you can have side chain as well where it's just very delicate and now it's adding a bit more groove, adding a little bit of feeling, but it's not obvious that it's pumping when it's in the rest of the track, right? So if we switch it off, it's just really nicely grooving that hi-hat. So that's a way you can use a side chain, not just as a corrective thing. In this case, it's being used as more a groove enhancer, a creative move. Let's have a look over here. We can see where the threshold is. We can see that we've taken away a lot of gain at the moment or whatever. It, it's not a lot, but um, we're just over the threshold. So we're only doing a little bit of compression and you can see up here the attack and release again. It's just doing a bit of gentle side chaining. Only a tiny amount, but I think it adds a nice bit of feeling there. And maybe we'll just give a little bit of makeup, put the volume back. But again, I'm not trying to make it loud. I can do that many, many ways. Just want to side chain feel, no obvious pumping, and get it back to feeling like it was without the compression, without the side chain. We kind of match the volume. So if we turn this rack off, let's hear just on the hi hats. That's what they sounded like before. That's what they sound like now. Okay, in context, and sometimes if there's something that you're not sure about, I'm A being everything, what's improving? Okay, so the glue compressor is a bit aggressive, so now I'm going to back that off. It's a bit too, too much. Better. Just a bit of gentle, checking again. Yeah, I'm more happier with that. And again, I can individually, is the EQ how I want it? Is the side chain positive? Is the glue compressor working the way I want it? The span's doing nothing. I still feel like also with this, set it up like that that's my preference there okay so let's pop the mixer into the view here let's do the volumes again now that we've played around a bit with it cool all right so let's say we knock off the bass let's bring the shaker in knock off the kick for a second as well so we've just got three things the clap the hi-hat and the shaker let's go straight into the mix rack on the shaker
Hope you're finding this interesting, by the way, you know, watching over someone's shoulder as they go about mixing a track and using Ableton tools. This is Ableton Live. These are built in. Yes, I'm in 12, but there's not much differences apart from visual stuff. If you are enjoying the content on this channel, please like, comment and subscribe. It helps everything grow and develop here and I can put all the energy into more and more live streams. OK, let's crack on. This is mixed down and balanced today inside of Ableton Live on this project that now is yeah, had four stages of work done on it. Let's crack on here with the shaker. So we know the hi-hat and the shaker definitely have a role together up the top here, up in here. So shaker below the hi-hat, shaker perhaps above the hi-hat. Or a little bit closer together. I think the shaker makes sense at the moment to be a bit brighter. And saying that actually, it's a bit too dominant. So maybe there for the moment. Have a quick look at it. Um, does it have any obvious kind of stereo in the sample or sound we're currently working with? Well, it's panned over to the right. That's something I did before. It feels like it's okay in terms of its width. It might could do perhaps to be a little bit wider. No obvious problems in the waveform. As far as bad resonances kind of popping out there, which is good news. Haven't used the drum bus yet, but that's something we can use to enhance kind of sounds. The saturation that I'm using on the return tracks doing a good job. And I would say the shaker could do with a bit of compression, as again, I feel like the difference between the hits, well, it's pretty close. There's not a huge difference in loud and quiet hits. It's not in the in happening at the same time as the kick, so side chain would would not be doing an awful lot to it. Let's have a look at the hi hat with it and have a little play with the EQ. This is the closed hi hat EQ. I think I'm going to open that back up a bit and have the shaker a little bit down and have the hi-hat up in here a little bit. And if the shaker sort of bothered me a little bit um, at the top end of it, could also bring in a high shelf here. Let me turn this off for a second. a little bit of high shelfing up here and then add that as well or just keep it with a high shelf so different alternative there but I think maybe the high shelf versus yeah, I kind of feel that is a better solution. It kind of just gets it out of being quite so dominant up there and lets the closed hi-hat kind of groove away in that area. All right, so what else have we got? Well, we've skipped the hi-hat pitch down. That only really happens over here. We'll come back to that in a moment. It's not super important to the track. It's actually this same track up here, but just simply with a pitch down. So we could almost probably copy everything from the hi-hat track, this complete setup here, and paste it onto the pitch down, which is just a, as I said, a version of that. And then we'll, we'll come and check that in a little bit. You know, I'm not gonna be lazy and just say that's it, job done, but I'll go and revisit that in a bit and just make sure where it plays that, that, it, that it is balanced and that is the right decision. So let's say what we do wanna check over here is the percussion which is next after the shaker and that's sort of sitting 
over here. So I've just moved my loop over a little bit and it's sometimes good to see like, you know, where does the loop repeat, you know, so that we make sure that we catch sort of more or less all the hits inside the loop, right? But that looks pretty good, the, fra the phrase I am in at the moment. And if I'm not sure about that, again, you know, I can always zoom out and go and loop sort of somewhere else, but I think I can do a good job mixing it here. So I'm happy with that. Uh, let's pop to the mix view again for a second over here. Let's have a bit of reverb on the shaker. Also a bit of saturator. All right, let's turn on the percussion. Into the rack. This one's really nicely defined as to where it lives. So for the moment, you know, there's not much danger of it getting in the way of the base of the kick or it's mainly probably gonna clash with the clap. So if we were finding those two, so again, I've got, I've made a mistake. I've got a bit too many things going on at the same time. So, you know, I can bring myself back to three tracks. So let's compare claps with the percussion. Feel the clap cuts through nicely as well as the percussion, so there's not too big a problem there. Same with that hi hat in clap and the percussion sound good. Same with that. So let's say while we are over here, let's bring the volume down on the percussion, rebalance it. Let's have a bit of Saturator, a little bit of reverb. Other way around, but same concept. look at position in the stereo field. That's mono. Okay, so this might be one where I choose to kind of give it a slightly bit more width to it. So it could be a good example for that. So how might we do that? Well, we're looking for devices that allow us to sort of add a little bit of width. Um, there's a bunch of options for that, um, but on percussion, I'd probably choose something called the Haas effect. The reverb's added a little bit of width, but it's, it's not visible here, but it's happening at the master track. But if we want to sort of see that we're making it a little wider, let me just try, um, I'm sure I've got one already set up. Um, let's bring in one of these over here, and then we can sort of see what the Haas effect is sure probably some of you out there have heard of it before. It's literally a delay that kind of has your left and right a little bit different from each other. So if we kind of set one up from scratch, uh, let's clear all of that. Just grab a default delay and stick it here in the rack over here. We want the delay to be in time, not synced. That's the first thing. Uh, we don't want the two of them to be the same, we want them independent of each other, these two values, if that's selected, they'll both be the same value. So we want them independent of each other. Feedback at zero, you can choose fade as the mode over here. And after that, 
it's dry wet at 100%. And the rest of this, there's a little bit of some fancy stuff going on here. We're not going to worry about that for today. We can switch that off. We're gonna build our own little Haas device here. So now, if we're over here, this is the percussion we're looking at. And let's say we solo in on the percussion for a second. And let's make sure we're looking at the percussion over here. And now let's change the delay on the right to the left a bit. And you can see we're starting to add some stereo interest here, which is great. So we've just created that with this little delay set up like that. So we are widening the um, percussion sound with a bit of the harsh effect. And again, if we don't want it, as much as that, then we can dial this all back a little bit and have it very subtle. But it's just pushing it out a little wider. I think that sits a bit nicer in the mix. And if we want to check, we can head over to our master, sum to mono, make sure we've not caused any problems there. And the percussion's coming through nicely there and the reason for doing this summing to mono is if I do make this more extreme now you can hear hopefully that the percussion does not sound very nice anymore and if we take the mono device off sounds great super wide and lovely and stereo and that's the danger of pushing things too wide if I now sum it to mono and I'm in the club where'd my percussion go it doesn't sound very nice right but if I bring it back now I've got a bit of width, we know that, we can check that there, and it's working in mono, and it sounds a bit more interesting in stereo, so happy days. Right, let's crack on, We're trying to reach, what have we got, Heath, I've got 24 minutes to pretty much get this track to the end, so let's work on the main things that I need to do to do that. And I'm always revisiting things, just checking in and seeing if I'm happy with the decisions I've made. Okay, so I would like a bit more of that shaker back. That's not bad. All right. So always revising, revisiting. So let's crack on. Again, we're going to remove some of these tracks. I think the drum kit's pretty good. I need to check out the 909 clap little fill that I have going as well. So I need to move my loop to that at some point. But let's say we do kick, bass, and we'll have the meld over here. And let's say we zoom out a little bit and just see where we are in the loop and how much of the meld we're getting. I also just going to have a look at the percussion just quickly before uh, up here. Percussion's sort of crying out that it could also benefit from a little bit of compression. As you can probably see, it's kind of quite a large gap between its peaks and its quiet areas, the dynamic range of it. So let's say we just visit that again quickly for a second. So let's turn meld off so we don't have that horrible loop. Put the percussion in. And let me just give it a little bit of percussion, uh, percussion, a little bit of compression. And I would bring that across in front of the Haas delay just after the EQ. We don't want to squash it, we just want to give it
kind of like it there. It's a bit more aggressive, but let's back it off again a bit. Kind of leveled that out quite nicely. with that that was just a visit for the percussion as I felt that could do with a little bit of that let's have meld let's get rid of some of these drum sounds so we're back again with kind of more musical stuff let's make sure meld is in the loop so we we'll zoom out here a little bit to check that there is up here okay so I could probably do with moving my loop somewhere where I can catch a little bit more of not this sort of more towards the end here a bit so it's a bit of a fuller section of it probably this last little bit up here I think would be good because we can see it's kind of bu building up and here was a little bit softer somewhere in the middle it's kind of louder but here I've got the other elements that I kind of want to check it against such as the kick and the bass in particular, right? So that's kind of why I've chosen that section to loop it. EQ wise. So let's do a quick look at the imager. So it's definitely not mono. It's got a little bit of stereo to it. Now there are some obvious peaks to it. But again, I don't see anything too crazy, but we could check these in case any of these are a bad resonance. This one down here, or these couple down here, are probably getting in the way of the bass a bit. So let's have a look at it in the EQ. Sometimes you can check high-end elements all together with your EQ decisions and low-end elements all together. This one I particularly want to check with the kick and the bass as it does kind of sit right here in what we call the low mids between 2 and 250. And this is definitely the baseline kind of area in here, right? So if we were to sort of add a bell here and let's say move it along here and then dip it bass should get kind of stronger a little bit, right? So it could be a case that we could sidechain this the bass or sort of dip it a little bit in this low mids area just to give it a bit more space. So what I might do is actually boost this for a second. Have a little listen. Sweep around in here. So that's the first very obvious kind of resonance. It's not a bad resonance, but it's very dominant. Um, and I think even if we're at zero, you can see it's well above zero dB. This line here is zero dB, so it's loud. So we could cut that one a little bit, bring it, pull it down a little bit. So 
out a little bit more tamer and then we can do something similar with this one over over here perhaps which is at where am I 232 Hertz so let's give ourselves a second bell um, this one here 232 switch that one on same thing Okay, so let's A, B this EQ now, just kind of listening carefully. So this one's a little quiet, so I'm just going to bring that slightly less gain out, but I'm happy with this one, the control of that one. And this, oh, the wrong one, I grabbed the wrong one. They are a bit back to front. Could also do the one in the middle, if being really fussy. But for the moment, again, what we're listening out for, which is the tricky thing here, is let's listen to the bass on its own. So we're kind of making them sit together nicely and if we turn off this EQ here on the meld you can probably hear the bass gets a little cloudy but with that the bass gets more focused so again it's a positive kind of decision the bass is also in the center and this is we already know a little bit wider which helps as well that they're not sitting directly on top of each other but if we go over to the bass just to prove a little bit about what I'm speaking about and we look at the bass and we look at its frequency we know it's low down here but if we grab you know a couple of these here hover over it it's 255 256 so we're kind of in that low mids area here and again there's no doubt that this is in the same area we can also do it this way we can bring up you know one of our analyzers and we can look at it here so here's the all the frequency of what's going on and if I take the meld away that's just the bass there and then if I add the meld we can kind of see where it is living right so that's why sometimes some of these meters are good if you're learning um, you know you can also kind of see a little bit about what's happening in the background there but ears are the most important thing you have and again we could even bring these down a little bit further than they already are so um, I was working on it but you know in essentially this point and actually one of these later can even come down a little bit further into um, again I grabbed the wrong one second time doing that so which one we want this one okay. and maybe we do put a point on the other one as well just to tuck it into the mix slightly so there's one in the middle here there which is at 279 so let's grab another bit messy here they're all kind of out of order but they're doing the same job So let's kind of control that a bit. We want to make sure our meld still sounds nice and it doesn't sound like a dog's breakfast because it's got all these kind of special resonance kind of cuts in there. None of those, by the way, were bad. As in when you hear a bad resonance, it's a nasty whistle or an ugly sound, but they're all loud. They're all going over zero dB in a way that they're very, very prominent, right? So now they're a bit more controlled. So have a bit of compression on this track as well just to level it out a bit on the meld and you can hear how much easier this is to work on in context with the bass it's its main clash and we're not like listening to the whole track at the same time right we're
A being always, what do we take away? What do we need to add back in? I love the glue compressor, by the way, from Ableton. I think it sounds great. It's the reason I tend to use this for a lot of the compressing that I need to do. So I quite like that decision for now. And if we AB the whole rack, it actually sounds more pleasant. It sounds in the track, nicely controlled. And let's say we bring up our mixer, and we drop a lot of things in. Let's level the meld. I think it's pretty close to where it needs to sit level wise. Yeah, I'd probably kind of leave it almost there. Let's see if we have a bit of saturator. And it's already back in the mix a bit. So not too much on the reverb either. Bring the meld, the rack out. That's quite a big difference in a good way. Sounds much more controlled now, sitting in its place. And if we mono the whole thing, the mix is starting to sound good, nice and tight. Sums to mono good. All right, let's see if we can get in about 10 minutes, the other little part's done. So let's have, I'll do less talking and a lot more mixing here. So let's say melody, I'm gonna check where my loop is. Pretty good position to do that. So I'll dive into the melody here. Back off what we don't need to listen to. Nice and stereo, just about too much stereo. If it starts to drop lower than zero on this meter, it may not sum to mono quite so well. It's not disappearing, but it's obviously a lot stronger in stereo. And that's what that meter's kind of telling me. Can go into that in more detail another day, what, how we can use this side of the meters. But it's almost a bit too wide, this particular melody. So what I would do to combat that is actually just drop in a utility here just in front of the span and I'm just going to pull the width down slightly and you'll watch what's going on in that meter right there's mono and here I'm kind of dialing it back and now I've got this meter zero to plus one and if I sum to mono it's much more of an equal sound now so that's the trick there in a quick version so that's a good decision. Let's go to the EQ. So this is sitting similar area to the bass, the clap, you know, the mid frequencies where everything's kind of clashing. But again, it's kind of doing its own thing a little bit. Which is good, it's a little higher than the meld. So low end wise, I'm pretty happy it works well with the bass line and the kick and things. It's not really in the way of those. Ah, I need to be up here. could side chain it to the kick if we were worried that the kick was suffering because of it. It's definitely a sustained sound. It goes over the kick pattern as well as the bass pattern. There's meld. They're sitting okay together. Again, if we were looking at some of these visualizers there's the sum of those two together if we take away the melody there's the meld where it's sitting in the frequency spectrum 
they obviously overlap, right? You're always going to get the most overlaps in the middle. But I think they're sitting okay together. I wouldn't obsess too much about that. But I might actually copy. Something there. Let's just see. Let me just click something a bit funny there. Hmm, interesting. What's that going on there? Come across that before. Let's try that. Okay, and revisit there. Hmm. Stop, 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 stop scrolling. Why are you scrolling up and down automatically like that? Let me try grabbing the handle there. I'm gonna stay up there. That's super weird. Maybe just uh, give me a second there. I'm just going to see in the settings there. Uh, I know there's a new kind of, okay, follow behavior, scroll, let's say page, try that. Um, might be the solution, hopefully. No, it still wants to scroll. Okay, weird. All right, I'll have to uh, understand what happened there. I'm not sure. I just clicked on something. If anyone knows kind of what, what went on there, let me know. Anyway, I've kind of got myself to the melody here. But what I wanted to do is actually take from... So that's a bit annoying. Uh, let's do a quick save. And then we'll just reopen this project. So open, reload, set. That's what we want. Uh, we want to save. Just give it a second to do that. Okay, looks like I'm back in business. So, a bit strange, not sure what happened there, but um, that was a, you know, maybe in 12, sometimes something a little bit glitchy goes on. So, just try and recover my focus there. I was looking at the melody. What I had in my thoughts was to come up to the bass line and uh, I have a sidechain compressor on the bass line and I'm going to copy that and I'm going to add that to the melody track. And I'm going to see if this could benefit from a bit of sidechain compression here just to have it like sort of groove and lock in a bit to the kick and the bass a little bit. So, so I'm just going to reset the sidechain compressor so it's neutral for a second. And it's going to have this little bit of, again, don't really want an audible pump, such as that, but a little bit of subtle. It's going to make it really groove nicely when we get our groove back, because now it's following the envelope a little bit of the kick drum, and it's sort of ducking a bit when the kick happens the sidechain kick track that I created earlier. And again, if we want it just really subtle, just back the threshold a bit, off, back it off a little bit so that there's just a little less over the top of the threshold. That's all it's compressing. So if we put everything in now, Okay, so let's do our finishing touches on the mixer of this, of the, of the melody, let's volume balance it. The sound itself well, it already has some kind of reverb to it, so it sounds quite spatial in and back. It doesn't need me to help that a lot. It's already tucked back a bit, but I will give it a bit of saturation to give it this common feeling. Right, now let's see if I can do the arpeggio and the chords and then we, I think, can call it a wrap uh, for what I was trying to get done today. So let's open up the both the chords and arp. I've moved my loop again to somewhere where I can access those two tracks. Both of them look good here in the sense of like I can get my, roll up my sleeves and get stuck in. Let's do the arpeggio first. Let's try and get it balanced and mixed down here. Let's again kill off our drums for now. That 
bring ourselves back to kind of musical elements. that are playing at the same time. So we can have the kick for context and the bass. Let's dive into the ARP track. Let's have a look at kind of what it's doing in the stereo field. Quite wide, no phasing issues, sitting in its own space. Should sum to mono nicely. It does, happy days. All right, box and go span. Any nasty kind of obvious resonances that pop out? Again, not really, but it's busy down in here and again, my bass line is down in here, so controlling this area of frequency is gonna be pretty important. Because if I go to the one on the master track, that is the Vox and Go Span, this one, and then we knock off the ARP, where this is currently the kick and the bass, right? What they're doing, and then we put the ARP in, you can see it's kinda here, as well as higher up, so that's good to know. So let's get in here. A low cut is going to be pretty helpful. And I think I finally got a resonance for you guys and girls to take on here. One that's not nice. And I don't know if you can hear it. I'd love to put out a poll there and say who can hear the bad resonance, but it's this one here. Yeah, where I'm hovering my mouse, which is 416. So if we put a bell at 416, and we're gonna boost it first, so we're gonna emphasize the resonance. So we can kind of hear it. And then I'm gonna use my little trick here of the headphones so you can kind of hear it more clearly. And how you can tell when it's a resonant that you might not want, you might want to cut away, is it, we've boosted it so you can really hear it. But if I take the boost away, you hear that tone, it's like, it's like a whistle. And you still hear the right? So it takes a little practice, but we're gonna cut that and bring it down a bit. Tuck it into the mix a little bit. Okay, and up here, Check what's happening up there in a moment. I'll check that with the hi-hats and the shakers and everything. A, B it, so I know exactly what I've done. And we could also have a bit of a, a dip down in here. Let's maybe turn this one on. I don't think that sounds so nice. So I'm gonna drop that one down a bit as well. Maybe open up a little bit of the low end on the low cut and work more on these kind of cuts here and let this open a little bit. I think it sounds a bit more natural. Could also be a candidate for a little bit of compression, just to eat, level it out slightly. that 
off a bit. Get it to groove. Put it back to the same volume as before compression. And we'll also copy over the sidechain compressor. It's on the meld and put it here as well. well where did that go actually? Was it the meld? Sorry, it was the melody. My mistake. So let's copy that. We could also label this, but it's fine. I kind of know which one it is. So I want to bring that up and drop it on the arpeggio there. There it is. Let's bring that in by the EQ8. Reset it a bit. Again, just tightens things up slightly on the arpeggio as well, just gets it to groove a little bit with everything else. So we have to watch the percussion, but it doesn't get lost behind the arpeggio, so these two are also kind of a bit of a clash. So what we might do is just check and maybe on the percussion, I know it changes pitch so when it's up here it's a little bit more comfortable when it's a higher pitch but at the lower pitch 339 it's a little bit maybe tucked away. So what we might do we could either boost the, the percussion here, but I'm actually thinking to go the other way. So let's visit the arpeggio and let's look for 339 on the EQ. That's where the percussion's hitting. So it's kind of in here somewhere. Let's add another bell, 339. Switch it on. And let's say we boost it first so we know where we are. It's right there. That's kind of where the percussion is on the other track. And now let's cut that a little bit. will just help the percussion get through the arpeggio a little bit better. So that's, that's what I was doing there. Okay, let's now work on the chords. Let's turn off a bunch of this stuff that we're not working on at the moment. And let's just quickly take a look at the mixer as well for the arpeggio track over here. So what's happening there? Right over here. Okay, so arpeggio, a little bit of saturation, volume. little bit of reverb just to place it in the space and a little bit of saturation keep that theme going so bring the percussion up slightly now let's have the chords Let's work on those. Nice and stereo, again, almost touching on a bit too much. So same technique as before. Let's have a utility in here and let's maybe just bring the width back a little bit. So we're sitting nicely on that meter. And again, if we mono the master track, we don't want our chord track disappearing. It's not disappearing, it's a little bit better maybe improve it a bit more. Let's 
still sounding good in stereo, but it sounds better in mono for that utility and winding in the stereo a little bit. So again, that's a real big, big tip um, for you guys and girls out there. I've run a little bit over. I won't be too much longer. I'm just going to get this last little bit of balance done and then I'm done. If you're enjoying the content on this channel, please like, comment, subscribe. And I hope you've really enjoyed this mix down and uh, balance here as we've kind of been, you've been over my shoulder looking at me doing this in real, real time. It's a real, real case scenario here. So let's get the EQ in on these chords. Have a little look again and listen. They're kind of sitting up in the same areas. A lot of these synths, as you've seen over time, that there's plenty going on. I like the control of the, the volume better on these and I don't hear any bad resonances at this point in time. So I think we can clean the chords up and put them in their space a lot quicker. Certainly baseline wise down here, there's no real clashes. It's mainly with the other synths that there would be clashes. Uh, quick feel for if I'm going to compress it or not. Think again, a little bit of gentle compression. Tighten that up, levels out that performance a little bit more. Let's turn the rack on and off. Here, what is the biggest change? It's the utility, right? That's what sounds the most different here, but we know that that's going to help when we look at it in mono. I'm just going to revisit the ARP track and also do that with the arpeggio, switching off the whole rack. Yeah, I had a feeling probably Side chain, it's a little strong. So we'll back it off a bit. Don't want too much audible pump. And also the EQ. There's a fair bit going on. I don't like when there's too much of this happening. It's a getting on the edge of a bit too much. So I'd probably fine tune these a little bit. Just so they're just doing what they need to do they're not really changing the sound other than what's necessary. I like to keep things sounding good and natural like they did previously, but now they're beneficial to what's going on in the rest of the track. So let's visit the mixer page. Bit of saturation from our send return workflow. Chords are quite up front, arpeggios in the back. Kind of quite like that. And I don't want to push the chords behind. I want them kind of in front and the arp a little bit behind. That's how it feels to me. So let's do a little volume balance here. switch on all the tracks. The two I haven't mixed are the two little tiny kind of fx -E type details. Just to clarify, I didn't in the end tackle 
just for time purposes, the little pitch down uh, hi-hat, which I've copied over the rack from the actual hi-hat that I mixed, and I will refine that, but that should be pretty close starting point. And the other one I haven't tackled is this little 909 clap thing that comes in every now and then. I think we can live with those as being kind of like two little moves that I would do just to tidy up the rest. So in two hours, this track should be, I'm pretty happy with the mix and the balance. Um, it's summing to mono nicely. So if we put everything in and we loop it up at around this point in the track, which is a poster break at the kind of peak here, and we're playing here. We're looking at our meters a bit. We sum to mono. Of course it narrows and sits in the center now, but that's a nice comparison between the stereo mix and the mono mix. We've also got a nice looking frequency map here of the spread of our frequencies from the lows to the highs. Pretty good balance there. If we're looking at this meter, again, mono stereo, no phasing issues on this meter here. So meters look great. So now for the acid test a little bit. Let's have a quick look on the master track here. We're currently at minus 4.98 at the average P volume of what's going on in this current playback here. Let's switch on the reference Let's see what that's hitting. So it's a little bit quieter. So let's say we just, I just adjust the mix slightly, all the tracks in the mix to be down a little bit in volume. Five, seven, what are we looking at over here? Six, nine, nine, so we can go a bit further down. Let's go another dB down. kind of looking for the current mix down now to be roughly hitting on the master track meter here a similar average peak then it's a fair comparison so we're at minus six six one and on the reference you can hear it's a bit louder that's pretty close so what we could do is we could use this reference which is the render of the last mix uh, the last session that I was working on in the live stream and this is what we've got today now it sounds quieter but if we listen to things like the kick and the bass line and then we go back here the bass lines awful in there it's disappeared kick is not very strong the synths are very dominant the clap of the hi-hat sound okay let's come back so what we could do is if we want the clap and the hi-hats to be a bit stronger here, they're a little bit low in the mix, then we can bring those tracks up individually, right? So we can just click away somewhere and then come here and say, okay, let's have the hi-hats up in this mix, right? Let me just undo that for one sec. I want this one in the middle because I haven't actually touched that one, but I want that and that. All right, let's do those. So they could come up a bit in the mix, right? So now they're a little bit louder. Same with the clap if we wished. Okay. So we can use the reference if there's something we prefer about it, as in where some of the elements are in the mix, then we can adjust that in our new mix down over here. But overall, the balance is the key thing here. As I said, the synths, it sounds louder. 
and the synths are super dominant, but we don't really have a bass line, it's very weak. The kick drum is a bit lost. It's just the hi-hats and the synths that are loud here. When we come back over here, we've now got a punching kick, a nice sounding bass line, and as I said, we can tweak all those other levels. So if again, we want the synths a little bit louder, then we can bring back up our, our chords over here and not at the expense of the bass line, et cetera, and the kick. So I'm really happy with that. What I would do now is render out that mix. So, you know, I'd pop back over here and I'd loop up, you know, all of that, right? Um, didn't mean to do Command K, we'll get rid of that. So I'd loop it all up and then I'd render, you know, what we've done today, which is all of these tracks, the balance and the mix. Um, it's also at a point where if we come back over for a second here and we're in that loop, sorry, I just need to re-loop that where I was working, which is kind of here. So let's say it's those two clips up there. So we're currently here in our mix down version that we're listening to. And if we bring up the mixer and we're looking at the master track, we're sitting around this minus six dB over here really good place to be uh, for a mix down that would allow me to sort of send this off for mastering and have a master engineer go to work over here on the the master track or I could master it myself and if let's say I do a very quick master self master here just purely adding a limiter I'm going to use the fab filter pro l2 as the example so here's a limiter on the master track the mix is at minus six, and now I've got all of this gain to put back in. And somewhere around there is about where my mix down now sounds like a master track, right? And I'm sure you'd all agree that with some limiting on a nice balanced mix down, the track sounds really good. And as I said, if we're comparing it, what we're comparing it to for the moment, sorry, I didn't mean to open that, is we're comparing it to the last uh, mix that we had, which was our reference over here that we can solo in the same place and play. And let's make sure the limiter's off, or you can have the limiter on. But it's the kick and the bass to me that really don't work in there, loud drums, synths out of balance we turn that off and now we got a bass line a kick and a really nice balanced mix with the limiter so what i would do as i said is i'd now add that limiter like that eventually render out this mix with the limiter on it go away test out the track listen to it get objective with it see what i feel about it and maybe it goes to a professional master engineer. Maybe I DJ it out with the limiter like that, just sitting around zero dB over here. We could see I might tweak that a little bit and I can test it out and always come back now and tweak this mix if I need or anything like that. But I think we've got a really good base there to work from in a couple of hours. So I've stretched over time a little bit today. Of course, if you've enjoyed the content on this channel and this mix down and you I hope you find it useful and the, the psyche and the mindset, there was a lot of talking in the beginning, but it's all stuff I've learned over doing this for like 20, 20 plus years and helping a lot of other people with um, mixing their tracks and getting good mix down and balanced mixes. So on that note, I'm going to wrap up the stream for today. This will be the end of the journey of this track. If you haven't followed the journey along, uh, do check. It's inside a playlist and you can go back and start from the idea that was done in Scratch on another video and then it was arranged in part one and part two and now today we've mixed it down. Should I release it? Let me know in the comments below. Do you, do you think of a label? Can you think of people who might enjoy this track? Stuff like that. Let me know. Should I carry on and release it and let you guys and girls know how that journey went? What did I do? That would be interesting to know. Thanks for joining me. If you are new here, of course, welcome to the channel. If you return to the channel, well, welcome back. Um, it seemed a bit quiet in the comments today. That's okay. ALP, thanks for your interaction. Um, hopefully, if you're watching this back, as I said, you find it really useful. I'm going to wish you a great rest of your Sunday. And I'm going to say a ciao for now from Ibiza. And I will catch you in the next weekend's live streaming. Thanks for watching and bye for now. 
Cheerio. Ciao.